What you're about to witness is one of the most sinister sounding intros to a trailer to one of the greatest epics ever produced. And there's more. Because you are going to see it as well. Yes, it. Yes, it. Bees are often considered a symbol of the goddess of divine feminine because they are ruled by queens. In particular, they are associated with the goddess Venus because part of the labor is the indirect fertilization of flowers, all of which come under the dominion of Venus. Without bees, many species of flowers would die out, and so the bee may justly be considered a handmaiden of that goddess. There is a Greek tradition, too, of the nine muses, the divine patronesses of music and poetry, taking on the form of bees. This comports well with the rulership of Venus over the arts. Another occult tradition states that the mysterious figure Melchizedek, who is mentioned in the Bible in connection with giving communion to the patriarch Abraham, is an entity that brought three gifts to Earth from the planet Venus, the bee, wheat, and the mineral asbestos. The tradition is an allegorical one. The meaning of the three gifts may be partially understood as symbolizing three grades of initiation. In the first grade, one serves B. In the second grade, the initiate focuses on understanding and practicing the development of the many out of the one, wheat. In the third grade, the initiate becomes a channel of the divine fire, he burns, but is not consumed, asbestos. In the sacred tradition known as the Kabbalah, the planet and goddess Venus are associated with the Sephira Netzach. This Sephira is also called Sekel Nisetha, or the occult intelligence. Two of the potencies of human consciousness that have the root in Venus and net such a creative imagination and desire. These are two sine qua non of occult development. Without knowledge of the right use of creative imagination and desire, the aspirant makes little progress. The bee is also a symbol for wisdom, for it collects pollen from many flowers and turns it into the nourishing honey, which is the gold of bees. Just so, the occult aspirant collects experience from the varying circumstances of his life and from it extracts spiritual gold. As the spiritual alchemists imply, the life of the occult aspirant is his laboratory, and his consciousness and his body the subjects of his spiritual experiments. A well-known cosmological myth from the ancient Egyptian city of Heliopolis Greek for City of the Sun, but known as Anu or Iunu in Egyptian, and which is now located in a suburb of modern Cairo is that the sun god Re was self-generated, having spontaneously arisen from the primordial waters of the Nun. After his self-generation, Re began to generate other gods. Another story provides additional dimension to our subject. A lesser known tradition, and one that the priests of Heliopolis themselves are said to have taught as part of their allegorical mysteries, states that the goddess Neith was the first deity that emerged from the waters of the Nun, making her the foremost of the Egyptian gods. Having arisen from the Nun, she rested upon a primeval mound that had formed in the midst of the waters. Raising her voice, she uttered the first sounds of words of power, Heikau, in Egyptian and then created light. Next, she became virgin mother of the sun by giving birth to Re, who appeared as a child on the horizon. She granted the power of disseminating light to Re through the vehicle of the sun, then in the form of a bee flew off to the place where the city say is called Sao in Egyptian, and which was situated in the middle of the Nile Delta, was to be in order to establish her cult and temple there. The temple of Neith in Sao is traditionally known as the House of the Bee or Hut Bit in Egyptian. There are a couple of other myths that support this version of the Heliopolitan cosmology. First, there is a story from the corpus of myths surrounding the battles of Horus and Set. The Council of Gods convened to decide who should rule Egypt after the death of the god Osiris. Set had murdered Osiris and usurped the throne, but Horus was the rightful heir, though his youth and inexperience were considered unfavorable factors in the minds of some gods. After much discussion, the gods could come to no resolution, so they suggested that Thoth, the scribe of the gods, write a letter to Neith, whom they considered the wisest of the gods. Thoth willingly agreed, and began his letter, to Neith, the eldest one, the mother of the gods, who shone in the primeval time. 